off. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Pizza Time. I'm Dakota. I'm here with my co-host, Mario. Today, we have Brendan from uh, Tales from the Mall joining us. What's up, man? Oh, you know what? I was just, um, I went to, down to my dad. It's Father's Day. Happy and Father's I was, Day, Brendan. I was, thank you. I was down at my dad's house. And, uh, you know, I was keeping him company while he watched golf. Mm -hmm. You know? Word. I walked in on my dad watching Ron Swanson Best Moments YouTube video compilation. That sounds And I think God. he'd been uh, pulling the cork with my uncle all day. So he was just kind of sitting there with my brother. I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> but That's uh, nice, dude. Yeah. Thanks Nothing like having, having a drink. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah, I'm in uh, the driveway of my parents' house right now in my car. Just hot boxing myself. Cause I, it's just so fucking loud. I have like a ton of family over. I got my mm -hmm. aunt in from Italy. So I was, I'm extremely happy to see her. I haven't seen her in like four or five years. But, uh, yeah, let's jump, let's jump on in. So, yeah, we were going to discuss, uh, my dinner with Andre today. Um, I saw it, I saw it years ago. Um, I was in a improv course in college and we were we were uh i don't remember if it was required or not but i remember seeing it around then and just you know really being into that whole um i mean it's essentially it's essentially proto podcasting i'd say um mm -hmm. it's a it's a filmed conversation and then uh you know you've got andre being one side and then Wally is the other side. It's a very much a which way forward Western man kind of mm -hmm. uh, vibe that I got from this reviewing uh, from this past week. Cause I, uh, you know, I think Wally is kind of a stand in for your, your uh, person who wants to go with the flow to a certain extent and doesn't want to challenge the status quo and is trying to exist within it. And then you have um, Andre who sort of rejecting uh, his, uh, his calling in a way and trying to go out and push, push uh, dramatic performance to its, um, to the furthest reaches it, it can go, you know, but um, especially near the end when he's talking about unconsciousness and then, little bastions of uh free thought opening up i thought very much about the sort of twitter space and podcast space that seems to be popping up amongst people who are rejecting the uh modern narrative to a certain extent and looking for ways to awaken i guess and uh yeah i was just interested to see if y'all felt the same thing about it I was surprised that, that I, I I did enjoy this movie. I was like, I didn't I didn't know if I was gonna be able to get through a movie where it's just two guys talking, but I was so I was happy. I was I was happily uh when I walked away from that movie, I was like, I did like that movie and it's pretty amazing that that it even like worked on me, you know? I was like going into it, I was like, let's see let's see if this can hold, you know, hold me. And uh yeah, it was great. I really enjoyed that movie. Yeah, I was definitely impressed at, um, you know, how engaging they made it. And um, I think it was just through kind of the the strength of, um, you know, they set it up really nicely. You know, you have you have Wallace Shawn, you know, walking to the meeting and kind of talking about like how he's kind of just concerned, you know, and he's 36 and I'm 36. And, you know, he's talking about like how his main concern is like, you know making a living and and how he kind of enjoys like his quotidian you know going to the post office and mailing out plays and stuff mm -hmm. and so so they set it up nicely because you know he doesn't know what to expect he's heard these things about andre and then he gets there and so andre so so we're kind of primed to hear andre launch into the whole story um and at first i thought like God, andre is like you know i thought he was like kind of annoying you know like he's he's like kind of got these 
these things that he's doing that are um i don't know like it's just it's so new like i'm kind of a new age person so i mean i don't i don't i'm not uh offended by like some of the things that he was preoccupied with and some of the synchronicities that he was letting guide him or whatever but i did find him a little bit i don't know just kind of um you know because because you're kind of abrasive the, the, the in the way that the way that the movie set up you kind of like the audience is kind of seeing this through the eyes of wally you know mm -hmm. and um you know and and uh and so you kind of get this feeling of like well this guy he can go off and do all of these things and uh you know but uh but by the end of it i actually feel like i'm more of an andre mm -hmm. than than a wally like you know um wally to me and and i know this about wally sean that he's like you know like an eight like an like an atheist and like he you know he like fucking loves science or whatever you know but um mm -hmm. so i just liked i just kind of appreciated um like the way that andre kind of engaged with his own life and like tried to make something happen for himself in that way um i, I feel like what he was saying about kind of like wanting to be engaged with reality that i think like technology has enabled us uh, to, has created ways for us to like disengage even further mm -hmm. and i'm I, like kind of always on the verge of like shutting everything down like twitter instagram podcasting yeah. and just like trying to like live life more as a normal person and i think wally was kind of offering that possibility to andre mm -hmm. for sure and like um there, there's a lot of tie-ins to uh, another person I like a lot, Eckhart Tolle, uh, who's just mainly talking about how to invest in the moment. And I think Wally does say that there is enough in the cigar shop, for example, that would be able to awaken you. And then Andre says, you know, yeah, but you need more, right? You need more today. And it's funny that this is happening in 1981, you know, Versus now, I think I, I I I just assume that humans must have always felt like this at different periods of time. Oh fuck! I just my bad. <laughs> I just accidentally honked the fuck out of my horn. Go on. <laughs> Sorry. Like I think I think there's and in, in that initial to get back to that initial monologue from Wally, it's so funny because he says he can't make money as a playwright so he needed to do something more sensible and become an actor which i think is like there's this it's so it's it's so dry but there's something so funny about it um there's another one just about how he he would he would love to just go home and have a nice home cooked meal but their their economic uh situation has forced his girlfriend to get a job waiting tables and it's the most I don't know, extremely entitled to me, the way he delivers that is just very funny. Um, well, I, I it seems like he's 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 just as out of touch with reality as 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 Andre is in a way. Well, I had questions about that, because what I know about Wallace Shawn is that his father was the editor of the New Yorker magazine, um, w William Shawn. And so, I mean, he just I mean, he like grew up like an upper Manhattan like yeah. literati you know so i just wonder like what you know how much he was actually grinding and how much how much economic insecurity he really suffered from but i wouldn't put too fine a point on that like this is art the, and you know this like, is also yeah, yeah like they 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 say that they're not necessarily supposed to be one to one um you know it's not like they sat down and just had a conversation it was written and it was filmed over a two week period you know so there is some artifice there. So whether or not Wallace Shawn was struggling economically, I think we have to separate that from the character in the movie that is called Wallace Shawn. You know, I think they're both, from what I understand, they wanted to write characters that were sort of extremes of themselves that they could hopefully leave there in the movie. Like that's what Wally said, or Wallace Shawn says that he wanted to write a character for himself that he could sort of, present there and then hopefully leave that energy behind so you know i'm sure they and i don't know if andre is as 
out there as he is in this movie as well. You know, I mean, I think another really interesting fact or, or aspect of this is just how Wally won't engage with him for basically the whole movie. There's that one little thing where he says like, that reminds me of this play called the lavender eaters. And then he sort of like says something and then it just trails off. Like he's not ready to like fully commit to him until he tells the story about the floating roof that is held down by beach stones. And at night it's light enough to come up and float up and meet aliens uh, and then that's when he finally like cracks a smile and is like, you know what I really think? And then he, then he kind of starts to actually talk about, um, you know, him enjoying that cup, old cup of coffee in the morning or being under the, um, electric blanket. Well, and that's, that yeah. is, a, I think that's like kind of the central tension holding the movie together for like a long period of time where Andre is kind of just monologuing mm-hmm. is that it's like, well, how is Wally going to react? How yeah. is he going to respond? What does he actually think about all of this stuff? You know? And, uh, and then you get to see that. And so kind of, that's the payoff, you know, that's the climax. Yeah. It is. Yeah. yeah. Cause uh-huh. he says early on, he says, I really think I'm really good at investigating, but all of his questions are very like surface level for, like 75% of the movie. Like he asks if the guy is still very skinny or something like. <laughs> yeah. That was Andre. Strange. Andre will tell Andre will tell a very long story and then he'll sort of respond to like a very small aspect of it. You know, he'll be like, Oh, well this or that, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, it, I think it's a really good example of like, proto podcasting you know just having the message be the content essentially there's not a lot of extra stuff going on i did really like the vibe of the restaurant you know and like that old guy who's the waiter is like a vibe as well you know and you get little visual interactions between him and wallace at uh through different uh points of the movie you know you'll see he'll be like clearing a plate and he'll like cut to him and he'll be like looking at wallace kind of out of the corner of his eye like can you believe this guy and then you know like it's the little things like that that's just really um that do make it engaging i think and i think there's other things too like what's up i was just gonna say do you guys think that there's like scripted podcasts out there right now like people are just they're already they know what they're gonna get into they have their they have their agenda and they're like, all right, we're going to talk about this and we're going to, we're going to do it like this. Like, it's actually not, it's actually not a free for all. And like, it's just uh, a good way to, it's a good way to uh, do a little bit of, do a little bit of, uh, it's like planned content. Yeah. You think that, I mean, it's becoming more like that. I've have a friend who's like telling me to like make reels on Instagram and, create time lapses and then she's like you know you don't even have to be painting the actual painting you show you could just show yourself blocking in something and then it just cut to that you know what i mean like so and i mean there is structure you know and i think that there is structure even to a free-for-all so that's probably another thing kind of brought up in this you know just like how much of it was planned? How much of it is later? Um, well, I was, you know, I used to work um like in in uh documentary, like in documentary film. Mm-hmm. All right. And uh, I was surprised when I saw that like they were like, okay, this is the script. And there'd be like a script for document like for certain documentaries, like You know, like when they have the talking heads come on and they say like, yeah, you know, Abraham Lincoln was at a crossroads in his life. And usually what they would do is they would say like, "Okay, we're going to interview this author who wrote a biography of Abraham Lincoln and we're going to find as part of his book. We're going to insert that into the script and then we're going to kind of like say, like, could you could you talk about this part of the, you know, basically reiterate what you said in the book? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, But. um, I think um, I honestly sometimes think like if I had a chance to do two hours with somebody like a like two hour or one hour like 
pre-interview with some of my guests and then I would be like okay now we're gonna really do the thing and I mm. want let's let's go over that one part that was money you know I see but I don't I've never done that you know I had yeah. one I had one guy who like we did the show and he was like very like nervous he's like I can't just um I can't just talk like I need to know what what we're gonna talk about uh -huh. and so we like went and made an outline and we didn't follow it that closely but but I but we at least knew like that's there that we can we can lean on this if we run you know if we get into a tight spot and yeah. it actually went really well I mean it was really smooth was um, that the old pornographer guy no no he was he, he that was all that was off the top of, of our heads our, I really yeah. liked that one Irv Irv O'Neill Irv O'Neill yeah, yeah. he's really cool he knows a lot about about not just I mean I I'm not that interested in porn you know he had such like, a matter of fact kind of way about talking about it that I thought was really like this is just how old guys are kind of now it doesn't really matter like what they he's like yeah well this is kind of went this way and uh well that's kind of the way of things did he love <laughs> it <laughs> what's that did this man like love it a lot or something well, um, well, I don't know. I'm, I mean, he, he basically he got into he wanted to be a writer like of like a he wanted to get paid to be a writer. And like he moved to New York in the 70s. And like the first paid writing gig he could get was to like write a porno book. And so okay. he did that. And then that's just kind of how he got into the business. And then he edited porno magazines like he edited like I want to say that he was that magazine editor for Stag magazine. And he was an editor for like a like you know, African American ladies or not, you know, like, you know, black was he doing like, was it called uh, big black, big black butts. Yeah. Something like that. Was he doing like erotic, <laughs> uh, like, like, uh, like lady novels, like erotic no, he, fiction? No, no. I mean, his, he was writing erotic fiction, like for men for, and his audience was men. And, oh. um, and he actually wrote some, he wrote some hardcore pornography films and he wrote he wrote a, a softcore that I actually saw that I you, that you can actually find on the internet. Um, it's called Other Men's Wives, and mm -hmm. uh, it's kind did, of like an it's kind of like a erotic thriller. I mean, did it know. make it to a uh, Cinemax, Showtime, or HBO? Because if so, I may have seen yeah, I may have seen this as a boy as a I, child. I'm, I mean, it definitely was like. It definitely was like one of the like a, a Showtime or Cinemax type deal, um, nice. but it had like it just like had this like very, um, you know, it had a real like sense of humor, um, very like tongue in cheek. Um, but, uh, you know, it was it was interesting. It was interesting, but he's an interesting guy. He still writes. He writes um, uh, like sub dom erotic novels. He's he says that he's a submissive himself. Mm -hmm. and, right uh, respect, and so, respect. Yeah, yeah. So so you know, if you're if you're into if you're into the um if you're a submissive man looking for something to read, you should look up Irv O Irv O'Neill. It's not Irv hmm. O'Neill. It's Irv It's Irv uh, it's like David O. Russell. Yeah, exactly. But he was a good hmm. guest. He also knows a ton about um like noir noir film and uh, like pulp crime fiction and stuff like that so we had a lot to talk about sometimes i see a good movie and i just like i'm like why don't they just have these two just fuck the brains out of each other for a second like you know sometimes i'm like <laughs> they should just just give us a little dash of that once in a while you know when it's not like a porno movie it's just a good solid flick and you know give us a quick cut i don't see anything wrong with that yeah like my dinner with andre you know where was all this? Where, 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 I'm, like, I'm like, wait, where, where was all the fucking that. and sucking? Yeah, I was like, I don't remember that part. Well, there, there, there was that little, there was the part <laughs> where he's talking about the the two people improvising that they're on a crashing plane, and then they, the two people, sneak off into the woods afterwards because they fell in love doing this uh, life and death uh, improv uh, practice, which is which is funny. You know, it's like, yeah, at the end of the day, like all the artifice getting stripped away. Yeah. We could all just fuck each other. Um, mm. God, I sound fucking stupid. <laughs> um, 
but yeah well the um the uh, movie kind of reminded me of um uh, particularly like andre's story or whatever that i wrote um like a 13 part um radio play called the isolation chamber that you can find mm -hmm. on itunes or whatever and um it's about a performance artist who goes to like great lengths to kind of get into you know get into the work and um you know kind of like what what andre did um which I thought the most interesting thing that he was talking about was that um, the part where he's talking about how they like buried him alive. Mm -hmm. That was, um, that was interesting. Um, it was a sort of, it was a sort of uh, kind of uh, Holocaust esque human experiment thing where they were taken to a room. They're blindfolded and taken to a room and then stripped and then run through a field and then buried alive essentially and then pulled up and then they go to a feast and yeah it's extremely interesting um, yeah that played like a movie in my head when i was when i was yeah hearing it's that, very but... easy very easy to visualize and i wonder if y'all have any background in theater at all or if you've even just seen plays or whatever like again to get to that point of like him looking for ways to awaken yourself are there are there art forms now that basically don't hit the same simply because so much of our reality is filtered through like our phones and through performance like i think i is, I is, is kanye west is is kanye west off camera more engaging than than anything he's recorded you know what i mean like is is that what that is you know is that what we're seeing that when people come up and say oh well this is reality it is stranger than fiction at this point you know and i, I feel like we are seeing that more and more that the sort of art form or whatever the product is is almost sometimes is dwarfed by a person's personality outside of the work they create simply because we have more access to it through social media for example yeah that's an interesting thing like when somebody when somebody turns themselves down a bit for social media versus when somebody like is you know putting out like they're like turn into like a theater kid when they fucking get in front of their phone and they're like mm -hmm. hey guys hey guys their fucking face mm -hmm. muscles are going nuts and uh yeah like when somebody leans into it like that versus like when somebody has to almost like okay i have to i have to present myself in a more chill way because i want i, I want to come off chill i want to you know see more inviting and i can't really talk about how this makes me nervous right now. You know, I have to, I kind of, kind of have to fight through that to get my point across. And I've met people like that where I thought they were a certain way because of how they were on the internet. And then come to find out, come to find out that in person, they're five times that, you know, they can't shut it off. Like they're actually yeah. much, much more intense. And this whole time I thought maybe they're playing it up. Maybe they're acting a certain way. And then off camera, you're like, oh, holy shit. This person is like living this and this can't be turned down. This is who they actually are. Yeah. Um, I, I think that um, because we have so much contact with like, like visual and, you know, like recorded audio and video and um like in our in our homes and in our daily lives that i think that it that there's potential now for like theater like in person performance to be much more like that could be the most intense thing that that we could experience people don't the theater you know is not as important in our lives it was interesting in the movie to see these guys talk about the theater in this way that it's like so important to them mm -hmm. they feel like it's so 
that it's so um and you know and they think that it's so important to the world like that it can that it can make give people direct experience with reality and i actually think that um that for a lot of people who are kind of like i don't know just kind of like uh burnt out on on the um you know on screens and stuff like that that i think that theater has incredible potential uh it's not it's not something that i have a lot you know I've, I've acted in some theater and done and have some training but it's mm -hmm. not something that i that i have much experience with it is interesting and it, i find it interesting when i hear about actors actors that i love for movies talking about you know theater so passionately and like when i read this uh this book about uh dennis hopper's earlier career in life and in reading all the chapters about him uh you know performing in theater i was you know it sounded incredibly serious and like i just i never even think about that i never think about that part of his life i think about i think about all the movies that he did that i loved and how amazing of an actor he is you know on the silver screen but i don't that whole part of his life is something that you know does make up why he's a great actor and does you know and and did heavily factor in the way he uh you know how he perfected his craft and everything and it was like not until i read those chapters about his early life did i even think about him being in a play ever like shit yeah. like that yeah i i i i've had similar experiences where you listen to like your favorite screen actor talk and they talk like Al Pacino and they talk about the theater like it's the, their favorite thing. And that's where the real where they're actually doing their the real craft or the real art is in theater, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and it's like um, I, so there must be something to that, you know. You get yeah, to I mean, like, I, yeah. you, you, who, who, who gets to go and be someone else? You know what I mean? Like, I feel like that is. Uh, an aspect of art that we may be losing, you know, especially if again, like we're, we're podcasting, we're, we're vlogging, we're not adopting characters. We may be heightening aspects of ourselves, but we're not straight up playing another character. And I think it's also hard for people to see that, right? Like, oh, this person's playing an asshole. They must be one in real life. Like, I think that is sort of dismissive of the craft in a way. Like, the whole point about theater is, yeah, we can all access anything that these characters are portraying at any given point. You know, if we were pushed to these extremes or if we had, you know, these other things in our lives, you know, setting up these ramifications for us to behave this way. And that's supposed to be the sort of unifying thing versus the feeling I get more often than not of like, Oh, I'm so much different than this person who's actually bearing their soul to me. Like I'm, I'm like, I can't connect to this or I ever identify with someone, you know, and it's, frustrating maybe or or dangerous to to you know kind of look at everything without any graciousness or sensitivity it's like oh i'm taking everything at face value might be why we're not as interested in plays anymore like we want to we want to just see who that person is we we don't want things to be um filtered through anything we want to get the real we want we want documentaries we want the realness but obviously again to get back to your point of the scripted aspect of documentary there is literally no way for us to really be authentically ourselves at any given time you know that was the whole thing about andre's friend you know performing activities as a left-handed person even though they were right-handed like we have the ability to be anything but in that if that were ever achieved then that would sort of render us to be nothing in a way you know if you got rid of 
if you could be everything, there wouldn't be anything defining really about you, right? And I think that's where the art comes in. It's like, what aspects of yourself are you heightening or diminishing to create a certain effect? And is that a good effect? Is that effect something that brings other people in? Then you might have a piece of art on your hands versus say a conversation between some people trying to just sort of navigate that, right? That's, that's the craft. That's the mastery. That's the skill. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think I think that sometimes you think that with like your, um, you know, like with, with your these like so the social media personality that you're getting like kind of like this raw, unfiltered experience with a, a person. But, you know, I just just in my own experience, like social media is like a feedback loop and it's kind of I'm changing for it, you mm-hmm. know, like like based on like the feedback I'm getting, like the attention I'm getting and I'm becoming Mm -hmm. less and less myself and more and more this character that it's making me be so that I can get that attention, you know? Yeah. And that alternately this idea of being playing someone else that I can get access parts of myself that maybe I don't pay any attention to, or I'm not necessarily aware that I have um and i think that uh um you know i i think so i think there's a lot of potential there um it's like well i'm 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 just being i'm just being myself versus i'm being someone else um and and we'll see what that set what that reveals about me to me yeah, yeah. you know yeah it's, i mean who, it's who, a fucking who, slippery slippery one who, who is you who who are you when you're like interviewing people for your show you know yeah like i i've 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 listened to maybe five or six uh episodes from you you know and i feel like you give like a very nice amount of space to let your guests sort of inhabit the framework you were setting up you know i think it's admirable honestly um and you can bring the conversation in and out in interesting ways. Um, intersections on religion or drug use or literature. These are just kind of themes I'm picking up on from the select few I've listened to, you know, and I'd like to listen to more. Um, but I mean, but even within that, you know, you've got a really wide breadth, you know, come, you know, versus say like um, uh, the painter you had on a few weeks ago with the the mormon background versus like your 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 christmas episode with like howling mutant you know yeah well well in many cases i'm like trying to find the brendan that will act unlock them and sometimes it takes a little bit of you know a calibration Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's not I'm not the same every you know, I'm not ex- having the same feelings inhabiting the same uh, personality every episode because I'm kind of like trying to find, well, what works. And I mean, I do that a lot with people um, in my life, I think, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, like, I mean, some people are like very good about just like they like have like the internal locus of control, you know, like. They're like every situation they walk into, it's like, I'm, you know, I'm this guy. I'm and 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 it doesn't change. And if and maybe, you know, some people are attracted to it and some people are, you know, um, not. <laughs> yeah, even sometimes repulsed. And that's OK with them. You know, with me, yeah. it's a little bit more like I'm trying to find me and this person like. So that we can, you know, so that they will like me or you know yeah which i mean i is a kind of can be a frustrating way to live in the world i mean how much of a people pleaser do you think you are i mean is that what you're is that what you're talking about yeah maybe a a little bit yeah i mean i i think uh i think that it's like you know i mean like if if i was i would say it's like a six seven out of ten yeah you know and just to jump on that does i don't think that you like put up a go ahead 
I was just going to say like with, uh, with your show, like when, when you talk to your guests, like uh, what I, what I loved about it is like, you don't put up a front at all with, uh, you know, I don't, I don't hear somebody that's trying to act any certain way to, um, like a lot of p- podcasts or podcasters that are, you know, wildly, some wildly successful. It seems so obvious to me when somebody's like putting on this like serious front. And usually that front, from what I've seen, usually it's like kind of like this, this tough guy front that people, people really get into and obsess over. And I'm, I'm like, I can't get into podcasts like that because I'm like, I can't see this guy, like this guy's acting right now, you know, like, and I, I don't like listening to something when somebody won't, you know, when somebody won't put down that front, like if they won't fucking, you know, let, let you into their own life or, you know, talk about something more personal or open up a bit. If they keep that front up, like I can't get into it. I really like, I lose interest immediately. And there's a lot of people that I see online that it's like, man, I don't know how all these, all these people watch this. And like, they're, they're almost more of like a, they're almost like a, a political figure to them. That's like doing their bidding instead of someone that like, they can actually, I don't know, like listen to and like get a cute, a human, a human experience from. And that's just, I can't, if, if I'm not hearing that in somebody and they're not like letting their guard down a little bit and kind of letting you in, then I have, I can't listen to it. So I think that like you do a really good job of that. And that's why I think your episodes are so smooth. Thank you. Well, I, I, I agree with you, Mario. Like, I think that vulnerability is essential to actually relating to another person. It's yeah. pretty amazing to me. Um, you know, the way that, uh, I don't know that, that after all that time apart, you know, that Andre is able to just like jump right into this, you know, to just like go right into like his story that, you know, which is actually pretty crazy to Wally. But I think that Wally just kind of, um, you know, he, he doesn't, um, you know, he has a warm, uh, open demeanor. That's something that works really well with podcast interviews. You know, I mean, the fr- okay, so so I, I'm going to talk about somebody that I talk about all the time. And I have a love-hate relationship with this person. You know, I have a love-hate relationship with this person. I think that he's cringe. I think that his politics are cringe. But nevertheless, he has been able to kind of mine that like i'm vulnerable um kind of persona to get some really really good interviews and that is mark Marin. okay and i think that mark Marin is like he's i mean like i listened to some of his interviews with like um you know like william friedkin or like paul thomas anderson and he's yeah. had some great i mean there's just been some absolutely great ones like he's obnoxious okay like don't get me wrong and like i rarely listen to him anymore but um Mm -hmm. but you know i mean you kind of have like i think there's it's not a it's not a coincidence that he has these great interviews with these celebrities who could very easily just kind of like go through the motions with him and he also does like a 30 minute monologue about like how his cat died or whatever like Mm -hmm. you know um so I, I do think that 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 the personal vulnerability is essential because ultimately what I want is for my guests to they're, they're my guests, you know, like it would be like if you had a guest in your house, you would want yeah. them to have a good time. You would want them to be comfortable. You know, you'd want them to walk away feeling like they got something out of it. And so that's what I try and do. That works well with an interview show. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah. if you are if you're walking through your life, you know, wanting that to be the experience of everybody that you meet you might have a bad time you know absolutely yeah Yeah, i i I had a feeling you were going to say mark maron for whatever reason when you're talking (laughs) yeah he's uh he's really he's really fantastic i used to listen to him a lot um dude he was the pod king he was the pod king for a while he really was well you know what he's become obsessed with this idea that um that America is becoming like, like some kind of like fascist, um, 
you know, like, like some kind of like fascist police state. And he brings it up like in every episode, like even if he's just like interviewing, like, you know, an actor or whatever, he's like, he's like, you're going to, he's like, how do you feel about fighting the fascists, you know, or whatever. And it's like, they're just trying to talk <laughs> about it. And, um, and it's funny that I was thinking about that while watching my dinner with Andre, yeah, because Andre's he brings like, that up too. He talks about like how society is becoming more fascistic. Now, I don't actually think that he's talking about like some kind of authoritarian form of government. Mm. I think what he's actually talking about is like the the authoritarian demands that technology makes on the individual that separate that that can can t- you know kind of separate them from their humanity. That's what I th- okay. that's how I interpret what Andre was saying and I could be wrong. You know, um, no, that's dope. No, I think you're right. I think um, he's yeah, he's talking about, again, the sort of like. I keep saying, you know, like I've had this thought in my head for maybe a year or two where I'm just like my relationships with the world, with women, whatever, I'm being cucked by the dollar. You know what I mean? Like we've lost our ability to be incomplete and find another incompleteness in the world and find completeness through that. We have, now we have a sort of mediated, like we know that you're not good enough. So you need, you know, this product or whatever to make you perfect. And that, and that's the sort of fascistic, aspect i think you know is that you need to do these you need to do x y and z to be to be fixed you know and it's not like we're not broken you know we are just sort of like wounded i guess we're wounded but that doesn't mean that like we we are not incomplete like i don't believe that people are inherently or people's people's sort of weaknesses and vulnerabilities don't make them inherently flawed, you know, like that flawed aspect is what drives you to procreate or make something of yourself. And to, if society is going in this way where it's like, Oh no, we need to make everyone safe. We need to make everyone comfortable. It's sort of hiding your own personal impetus for you to sort of better yourself. And I think that's what a lot of the dialogue is on like Twitter and whatnot is just like, how much do you have to pull up, pull yourself up from the bootstraps? How much do we need a sort of, um, like a social safety net, a social safety net. Exactly. Well, I, so I think, um, uh, the thing that I find, you know, and, and I think um, as an artist, like a social safety net would be something that I would be, uh, you know, in, <laughs> in strong favor of. Yeah. Um, I think the thing that I find fascistic about technology is the demand when you're a, when you're somebody who makes something. Mario, you're a musician. Dakota, you're yeah. a visual artist. You know, I'm I'm an you know, I make. I make visual art and I make podcasts and all that is that I got to all what I can't just disengage from this thing that doesn't really make me that happy or anything like that, because like people will forget about me, you know, that feeling like I will become irrelevant so fast Mm -hmm. and nobody will listen. Nobody will read. Nobody will watch. Nobody will purchase or look at what I create. Yeah. You you can't really stop. You can't really stop rolling the dice. Yeah. And I mean, that's not good for making something really. No. Yeah. You know, where it's like, it's like, I gotta, I gotta like keep up with the, I gotta keep up with the attention cycle when really like artists need room to breathe and like on, that, the thing that Andre did. That's and, exactly, that's the Andre five getting years, off the grid. Yeah. It's like, can I come back? You know, um, cause I just gotta be constantly be like, you know, like pumping my brand, like, you know, or whatever, um, so that people will pay attention. 
And that's the question. Do you, right? It's yeah, like, I mean, that's, can you that, get, it can, makes you like, think I, that it does. It was, makes you feel that way. I don't know I, if it's true. I was in therapy this week and I said, I need to fucking paint a picture that I don't post online. You know what I mean? Not one that I don't post because I don't like think it's good enough to post like one, like, and there again, I really don't think I personally am performing that much for the audience. I think it's pretty, what you see is what you get just from my own, but like still to be like, I'm going to write a poem or whatever, and I'm not going to show it to anyone. Like, so much of, again, the fascistic thing, the demonstration of intent constantly. I'm here. I demand a space. Give me, give me your eyes. Give me your ears. Is extremely draining and frustrating. And like, I'm getting likes on a certain post and then another post doesn't get as many likes and then I feel bad about it. And then I go, well, what are you really getting? Right? Like my goal isn't even to like a like isn't even like, Oh, I enjoyed this. I need to figure out a way to make someone physically move their thumb twice over an image specifically. Right? Like I have to create something that elicits that response. Like that is actually what it is, you know, is it, and like, there's little things, right. It's like, do I post two photos, right? So if I post two photos, you got to swipe with your thumb to get to the next one. Your thumb's already there. I've noticed, you know, photos with posts with more multiple photos, get more likes because you already have to engage with it. It's almost like breaking that ice, you know, Whoa. And, you know, when you think about it like that, it, it, it does sort of like, it makes it less life or death. And you realize, oh, I am sort of, you know, like this is not necessarily like, oh, I'm going to go stand in front of this painting for five minutes and enjoy it in a museum. It's how do I agitate a person to see everything in the post and then give me a like or a sort of, or share or a comment, you know, comments, man, those are, those are hard to get. Someone has to really feel something from it. And then you go, well, how much do I need to agitate them? How much do I need to bother this person? Or how much of, how much of this do I need to affirm them with the image? You know? So, yeah, it's, there's a, there's a serious push and pull uh, behind the scenes with stuff like that. And I always, uh, I always think about, uh, there's this, there's this, uh, you know, skateboarder that is, you know, kind of, he's been aging and he's, he's no longer the young skateboarder that he was when I was watching his videos when he was younger and stuff. But, um, he, his name is Jim Greco and he, um, he posts, he post pretty much only when he has uh you know a new board graphic or a video part and every time he posts i know that i'm gonna be i'm excited like i know that it's gonna be maybe a board that i want to buy or a painting he did or a video part that's came out and like i'm stoked and that's the only time that he posts you know i don't know about this guy's you know he doesn't let people into his personal life i don't you know we uh all of like uh, the fans of his, all they get is when is, he only gives them something when it's ready and that's it. And I have great respect for people that have that control where it's like, I don't have, I don't, you know, somebody that doesn't show me every time they eat something or, you know, they're shoving their uh, significant other in my face, you know, like all that shit that like, I, I just don't care about when somebody has that control to pull back and only deliver when it's something great that they worked on, I like, I really would like to get to a point where I I'm like that. Like I respect that so much. Mm -hmm. I don't think that they're annoying anybody and they're, they're, they're only delivering like good things like into the world. Like there's, he, he like he never is complaining online. I've never seen him complain about anything, you know? And this man's been through, you know, the depths of fucking heroin addiction and all that, all that good stuff. 
And I just, I don't see the guy bitch and everything that he puts out is the shit. And I'm just like, I really would love to be like that. And I, and I cite him as like one of the most positive role models, you know, out there for me, because yeah. I've just kind of followed his kind of followed his whole life as a young skater kid that, you know, I get to watch his path as like a, as you know, um, a whole new, a whole new, a whole new thing. And I just admire that self-control, especially when it's like so easy to just let everybody in on every little thing that happens. And uh, I just, I, I hope that I can get there. That's what I would like to end up being like. Yeah. I mean, I think there's, I mean, aging, right. I mean, I'm, I just turned 30 uh, over time. Yeah. Do you want to be, Jeez, I'm sorry. I don't have a point. <laughs> well, I just, you know, like I, as the older I get, the more I just want to drop it, drop it. Like, yeah. I'm going to be 37. Like, you know, um, you know, I, I kind of am an under earner because I focus on art, you know, but mm -hmm. I need to support myself. And if, you know, I would like to have a family, maybe it's time to just drop it, you know, and like, focus on a career and you know and maybe come back to it when i feel a little more comfortable and not worry mm -hmm. about and not so much worry about like the social media grind yeah just make the stuff that makes me happy you know um but uh you know that's always a question in my mind. it's always a question because i mean you know it's kind of exa exhausting yeah for sure and plus, you know, I mean, I mean, to be a public figure is like kind of a, like a really vulnerable thing. I mean, you know, I oh, mean, yeah, dude. you know that, Mario. I mean, you know, I'm, dude, and imagine, I'm sure I can't imagine uh, like how much crazier it feels when you, in, you, you know, you have children or something. and You have somebody making a snarky comment about your child or something like how do you yeah. how do you not just drop everything when something like that happens and just go, all right, I have my home. I have the person I love children like why am i even why am i even looking out at more you know like i'm i'm not shocked that you know like maybe when you get married you should it should they should take away your instagram you know I think, <laughs> well i um i i once i had a tweet once that was like i can't wait until i'm you know i'm married so that i can throw away my phone and computer forever yeah that, that sounds know, some, cool right something like that yeah which it which makes dope. Which makes you real makes you think like, oh, am I? Is this just about being loved? Mm. Yeah, you know, like, you know, and like, why, why all of a sudden will all this stuff become irrelevant to me if I had love? Yeah, and she yeah. has to throw away hers too. A big, big time, <laughs> big time. I think, I no, think I hear cultivating you. cultivating gratitude is really hard. I'm really bad at it, and. I, I get in a secure place and then suddenly that's not good enough. And then I, I, I find a way out of it and then I go, man, I miss that. And it's really hard to center yourself, which I think the whole, again, to get back to that movie is, is sort of that, is that point is that they've both found, they're both working to sort of find that in their own life, you know, um, well, he, I, Wally's I, Wally's Wally's uh, uh, consciousness is heightened after the dinner because he's able to drive or he's taking the taxi home and every little spot reminds him of, um, you know, a memory and and then the world's alive again. I think when you're in love, the world feels very alive. And I think if you're making a really great piece of art, you feel alive and 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 uh Andre again talks about the moment after coitus when uh when all of reality comes back in, you know, and that's always been really real for me too. You know, I think that's why I like chase relationships to such a extent that I do, you know, and try and lose myself in wanting to know whether or not the person likes me or not. Is is it's it's anything to sort of escape myself. As as they say, in that if you were really to be able to sit with yourself, you'd be feeling yourself decay, 
you know, and I don't think anyone really wants that. I, I, I don't, I don't want to be 40, but I also didn't want to be 30 when I was 20, you know? So it's all, I don't know. I don't know how you stay positive about it other than when I'm able to stay positive about it. And I, it's really hard to ride it. You know, I think that's sort of the point. I think if you were able to access that all at all time, you, you, it's just sort of not realistic from what I can tell. I don't really know anyone who can. Do you, okay. Yeah. 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 Do you chase relationships like, you know, and that are like, this is just kind of something I'm curious about. Do you chase relationships that are like, um, realistically like available to you or do you kind of like get stuck in like fantasizing about stuff that actually may n not be possible because of fantasy yeah yeah i think um yeah pure, pure <laughs> fantasy what what the hell i'm an artist what the fuck <laughs> yeah so i recently come across this um this concept it's called limerence have you heard yeah about that this? was my whole that was my whole fall last year no, I was I'm watching a, a, a shit ton of limerence videos, and no, that actually that. helped a lot. It's sort of the it's sort of a word for loving from afar. It's sort of it, it described it describes so many like of my stalking? relationships perfectly. I mean, it's, <laughs> stalking can be. A, <laughs> I mean, yeah, can be uh, a component be... of it. Like, oh, it's, like really? it's basically just like it's just like fantasizing about relation, like getting obsessed with like unavailable people. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, who doesn't do that? The person, the person becomes an object for you to win, and if you ever do win it, then you realize it's not what you want, and then you get bored with it very quickly. You know? Oh yeah, there's something other than that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's. I think that's been my, you know, my pursuit of wanting to like be a musician and and stuff like this is like oh then then they'll all like me and I won't have this problem anymore, right? But, like, it's not true, you know? Yeah. There's always going to be unavailable people. And, um, yeah, like, I, 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 would just, I would just sit around my phone all day waiting for text responses. And, like, it took me years... I still fall into it, but it, it, you know, it, 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 it used to be really bad where I would just like, and then you like wait the same amount of time to text back. It's like psychotic behavior because you're so you're trying to like control it to the certain point that any sort of agency that that other person has becomes like an obstacle like you want to break that you want to you want to make them just be at your beck and call 24 7 but again if that if that actually does happen if that does happen where they they do become responsive to you then suddenly you go oh i'm not actually interested in it you know yeah that's and i think rough, it's really it, that's rough it's really similar to the artistic pursuit, you know, um, you're like trying to write us, write the perfect song. And then suddenly it never will be that right. It's always like, it needs some aspect that I can't, uh, articulate. And I think that's always been a, a sort of dichotomy between like my painting versus the songwriting. Whereas like painting for me, is like I'm painting a new painting every day. So it almost like gets rid of that. Like I don't be like, I'm never like, this is the one, this is the perfect painting. This, this proves that I'm a good painter, you know? Cause it's, it's become mm -hmm. like such a daily practice. And I think in a real realistic relationship, you need to be showing up for that other person and trying to be authentic and also knowing that that other person is going to have off days and they're going to have days where they, it feels like something is off. And that isn't necessarily a reason for you to jump ship, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I think that the whole, like, you know, some, like some have explained like that people get really into like limerent 
um, you know, like the like the limerence cycle is because you wouldn't be, you know, like somewhere, you know, and I'm not saying this is true of you, Dakota, mm -hmm. but maybe, you know, like, like if you had something real, like you would not be able to handle that or you believe you would not be able to handle that, that you are not good enough or adequate, yeah. you know, yeah. to actually have something real, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, exactly. So you're always keeping a really, safe distance and but then you almost you either take it upon yourself or you make it or you blame the other person for that but yeah exactly it's like i feel like there's i feel like there's actually a threshold of happiness that you can feel i think that comes through sobriety too you know where you're not artificially spiking your happiness at any given time it's like are you going to give your power away to another person, whether or not they're you're in a relationship with them or not? If, 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 if them contacting you is the highlight of your day, that's sort of indicative that you aren't really doing enough in your own personal life to perpetuate your own happiness. And that's sort of what limerence came down to for me. It was, oh, I'm not happy. I'm not happy right now. If this person texts me, I'm going to be so happy. If this person doesn't text me or whatever, I'm going to be upset. And that's my reason for un unhappiness, not my present situation, you know? Yeah. Whereas I think a healthy way to have a relationship is to just sort of fold it into, you know, your career and your hobbies and your friend group and sort of have a more balanced look and sort of where you're putting your energy and what sort of good energy is coming from you through that. Well, I have, I have learned that I have something wrong with me, boys. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I've learned that I am on, I am on this team and I yeah. sure have to work on that too. Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, they say it's, like... I think it's probably pretty common. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's something, it's like a... I think that actually limerence is, is seen as like kind of like a coping mechanism for an unhealthy coping mechanism for like when things are just not going well in your own life, you know? Exactly. You can kind of enter into this fantasy world. But I, I realize that I recognize that I did that from like a really young age. Like yeah. a really young age. Like maybe like Same. third grade, like Samantha McLeese, like that was never gonna work out. <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, yeah, there was uh, the yeah. girl. There was the girl three three rows ahead of me in church every week who I was too afraid to ever talk to, but I just thought about it all the time. Are you and sure this isn't like normal? Are you sure this isn't like most of people? I say I think it is normal. Yeah, it's not kind of normal now. Well, I think it's um I I think it's normal because of our we think it's normal because we relate to people that experience that. Oh yeah, that too. You know, I think that um you know, uh it's like kind of like the part of the artistic temperament which is part of yeah. like kind of like in a, a coping. It's the gazing. Yeah. It's the yeah. gazing out and like Again, I think, why would you make art if you were happy with art, right? Like, yeah. I think I, I stopped playing music when I was like 22 for maybe a couple years because I was getting into film. And my thought was, I love the music coming out right now. I really don't feel like I have anything to add to it, right? I didn't feel that way about film, was getting into film, you know, so... It's it's like, how do you do it in a healthy way? You know, like, yeah, you can make some really good art, but is it worth being miserable over? Probably not. But, you know, we, we, we idolize people who channel their misery through the medium. And, you know, hopefully they come out the other end okay. But uh, I, they don't I'm, always yeah. do that. I'm starting to think that, like, the people that want to create stuff and make dope shit uh probably like 
uh, also tend to not really want to just like lock down their, uh, you know, high school sweetheart or something like I like, you know, I think these things are kind of intertwined and uh, that like that f kind of never ending search or like that want for more does fuel uh, a lot of really good uh, music and art and all that, all that good stuff. And, uh, yeah, I guess it's, I guess it's pretty straightforward. Like, I think that those, those people do make the best shit and like, yeah, a lot of people that marry their first girlfriend don't really, you know, whatever, they're cool with their job or, you know, they don't, maybe they don't have that, that kind of dangerous quality that makes you, uh, that, you know, where you're almost never satisfied with what you're making or who you're seeing completely. And like all that shit is real messy and does is, is like very powerful fuel. And, uh, you know, people talk about how negative that is, but like, you know, it gets things made. It makes awesome movies, dope scripts get written. Like, all the stuff that like our that society needs is uh is made by people that have this uh this trait that can't that can't shake yeah that, that you know battle with it and they make the best shit i like they i really think that that's you the know. that's the fascistic element again of the of the of the capitalism thing that they're talking about in that movie is that yeah we are we've almost been given a way to capitalize on our ability to want more constantly and instead of yeah instead of having to settle we're we're promised more and more that no you just got to go a little bit further with whatever you're doing and then you'll get there whereas it is again it's available to you in the cigar store or on top of mount everest for uh andre like the journey could be extremely long or it could be right now but you're going to end up at that same place if you are able to get there well <clears throat> i i agree with them um, with what you're saying mario like like if i if i somehow were to like enter into like a healthy relationship i might lose that thing that drives me to create and in fact yeah you know when i was in my when i was 24 you know I had a band, you know, that was like, that, that, you know, it was like the world to me, you know, and like, um, and then I got into a relationship and I just dropped the whole fucking thing. Mm. Like, and I never was in a band again, you know, and I yeah. worry about that sometimes that like, I'm not going to be hungry for it. And so maybe like, but I still want that push pull, you know, like I'm, I'm just, you know, I like women and, I want that push pull. So maybe it's like I'm drawn to more like unavailable situations because I know I'm not going to lock that in. I'm not going to lose the hunger. It'll be there and maybe it'll, you know, that tension will feed me a little bit even. Um, I totally, I, 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 I see what you're saying. Yeah. I'm, yeah, dude. Like, I don't know. I'm sure somebody could like debate me or like debate us on that, but like, I, I have a I think I have pretty strong feelings about that. But yeah, again, I mean that's still like what is important to you at this at this point, right? Yeah. Is it cuz I think both yeah. are valid. I I, yeah. I I don't I don't I I I think I look down on people who settle down, right? But there's a part of me that wants that too. But I think, you know, Brendan, I don't think um that would ever go away. And you might even get into a relationship where you having this creative outlet keeps the pressure off of that relationship to the point that it would let it flourish more versus like, oh, you're my world now, right? Yes. Well, I have a problem with that. You know, like I'm kind of an all or nothing, <laughs> you know, like an all or nothing, <laughs> you know, like that's just like, and I consider and that I to took be that kind of... personally. <laughs> yeah. Like it's time, it's time to put our phones in the microwave. It's, <laughs> it's that day. That day has come. It's us. Um, 
yeah, I think I think kind of like the all or nothing kind of thinking is like part product of or it's it's a symptom of like whatever that the addiction the addictive you know yeah compulsive yeah i don't know it gets in it, you it you know everybody's different so i mean it's hard to really say like, like this is like the trait but I, I come across that a lot when i'm talking to other like alcoholics addicts and stuff mm -hmm. yeah i wanted to touch on that before you know before we're done um just sort of like how much of like to me i think alcohol was a thing for me to do when i felt like any bit of my artistic career or whatever was just never going to work out and i still have this thought a lot like i'll i'll play a show or mix a song that i really like and then immediately i'll just be like no this is still no good you know and like I think I have a much healthier relationship with alcohol now than I did, but it took me quitting it to kind of put it into perspective of being like, Oh, this is too much of a good thing. Kind of in the same way that I think you could obsessing over your writing or your music or your painting or whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Yeah. I do love those psychos though. Like that dude in whiplash and shit. Like I, lo I love that when he was like breaking up with that chick. When he was like, I, I'm sorry, I got to be the best drummer ever. I love yeah. shit like that, dude. Like, scenes like that, I'm like, oh, yeah. I'm like, nice, dude. Yeah. <laughs> like, that know, re got, that got... resonates with us, you know? We, yeah, we, I'm like, that's, we, we, that's great. We love that because that's, that's the part of ourselves we're almost afraid of pursuing in a way because if you do do it, you may actually fail, you know, you may fail. And a lot of people I think are afraid of that. So they're going to do the easier thing, which is like drugs or alcohol or whatever. And if you don't have that sort of drive, you know, one of my favorite painters is Francis Bacon and he was an alcoholic his whole life, but he also lived to be like 91, you know? Um, so like, I think that, I think he personally had a tenacity about him that was able to sustain his sort of unhealthy lifestyle for a very long time. Mm -hmm. I see, I can see that the Francis Bacon in your work. That was, yeah, it's how I learned how to paint was just trying to copy his work in the beginning. <laughs> Word. Are you familiar Word. with this? Are you, there's this painter um, named Max Beckman. Have you ever heard of this guy? Is he the German? He's German, yeah. Yeah, the German expressionist. He's great. Okay, yeah. And I mean, he 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 was he was he's had an early death, right? Um, I'm not sure how old there, he was, but he, he there's he one a, guy I'm thinking of who who he knew he was going to die, and he just painted every day until that, and that's all the work that is shown are these very like quick sketches almost, you know, because he was so he was just like, how can I get my point across? you know, as quickly as possible. And I've almost adopted that lately, you know, just like as soon as I see the image I'm trying to make, I stop because I know if I keep working it, it's going to get away from that initial aha moment where I'm like, oh, okay, I see what I'm trying to paint. Here it is. And then mm -hmm. I throw on a couple of flourishes and then that's the painting most of the time. And those, those tend to be more successful. Sure. You know, I think success is an odd, thing that I, you know, bring up a lot in therapy, bring up a lot in my conversations with friends of like, what is successful? I was just talking with my brother about the mix on one of our songs. And he's like, this song has the most plays. And then I'm like, well, I think it's our worst mix, you know? And like, I'm trying, I'm personally trying to figure out like who the music's for right now. Like, do I give it to the guy who... I don't necessarily love the mixes, but the mixes are easy enough to listen to for people that brings the replay value versus songs that I'm putting out that are getting not as much, not as many likes, you know? And um, yeah, it's just, uh, it's just, just something I think about. I see. Well, I'm sure you may have a episode of your podcast that you may not like, you're like, oh, I totally phoned that in. 
And then a lot of people respond to it. And then you get this like head scratch moment of like, well, what am I missing? Right. It's like odd when you do something that you don't necessarily think is that great or your best work or anything, but then you see a bunch of response and then you get in that weird spot where you try and replicate it. Whereas like the initial thing you were doing was almost half-assed. Yeah. That shit's so completely out of your control, dude. It's, it's totally, it's, yeah, you, it's really hard not to get hung up on it, but it's like, dude, yeah, d- you could scratch your head forever with that shit, you know, it sucks. Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've definitely had, um, I've had moments like that for sure. Um, I, uh, the, the thing that I think the, the, the all the other side of that is like when you just like are like, this is the masterpiece, mm-hmm. and, then, and then no one, and no, no one, one cares, shit. yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah because um you know i'm also a you know i'm not like you're obviously like incredibly skilled like i don't know did you go to art school no no I, I'm, I, also, um, I'm also a visual artist and i really yeah. wish i had more time for that um and i've uh, been really lucky in like having people who are further along in their careers be able to mentor me and sort of great help guide me like i'm in a really great discord with a painter named mauro martinez um who i'd love to have on at some point but uh he's he's really interesting he is a recovering uh heroin addict you know and he he picked up painting early on but he was you know sidetracked by his addiction for a long time but it wasn't until he was able to get clean that he was able to really focus on it. And then a gallery picked him up, you know? So yeah, I think sometimes you got to strip away all that noise, really figure out exactly what you want to do. And the other thing was that he was just selling his paintings for like a hundred bucks. Like he was just doing eight by 10 things for like a hundred bucks. And he's like, his thought was that I'm going to price these so low that someone is going to come along and be like, these are worth more than that. And that's exactly what happened, you know? Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah, pr- price to sell. And I think about that too. I mean, I've got hundreds of paintings that I haven't sold. And I go, what if I just did a fire sale of like $50? Like you just tell me what you want and give me 50 bucks and I'll ship it to you. Like I feel like that would be a very cleansing process for me. I'd be able to like move a lot of the work I've done. and give that up to other people, you know, cause there's a part of myself who's like holding on for that right buyer. But part of me is like, well, I've got so much supply and not a lot of demand. So why don't I do something to affect that shit? Sorry. Well, I, I think there's a, I think there's a balance because, um, yeah, for sure. You know, as an artist, you know, you want to like, you know, like you don't want to undervalue yourself. You know, that that would be wrong. Yeah, that would be yeah. wrong. Like, you know, I'm not, you know, practically giving away something that's worth a lot more would be would be bad. On the other hand, like. Selling work is really important, you know, with the podcast, like I made a decision where I was like, I'm not giving this away for free. Yeah, at all, at all. And then I actually started making and then and that's how you make money. And that's how I started making money. You know, it's like. Oh, like if people can't have it for free, then they will pay for it. And it made me realize like, yeah, I was, I was right. I mean, it's a, I, I make a good, product. you have a good product. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and I think with art, it's like with visual art, it's, it's really tough. Um, but I think there could be, I think there's potential for a balance. Totally. You know, um, I just, um, so I do this, um, uh, you know, this literary magazine, Apocalypse Confidential. And um, I just started uh, uh, moved into a new role as um, uh, the visual arts editor. And it would be cool to do like, um, uh, you know, like, I don't know, five or, you know, five or ten works. Just put it on the site, you know, if you wanted to submit something. Um, Mm -hmm. But uh, that would be cool. I'm just thinking out now. I love that. Yeah. Conducting business. Yeah. But um I would love that. And I'd love to uh, come on your show at some point too. I don't know. I was, I was, I always wonder, are you calling them when they don't know they're about to be called? No, they, we set it up and then they call. 
Because you yeah. always go, you always go. Guess what? <laughs> You're on Tales from the Mall. Well, that's just like a little gimmick. <laughs> no, I like it. I just, I it always makes gets them every like, time. Are you just, are you just cold calling them at some point? The well, block number. <laughs> Who is this? Well, Mario, <laughs> Mario called me from a landline. Yeah, my grandma's was, house phone. That was pretty amazing. Might be the last call ever. Uh, outgoing Taking call on, on that, that phone. <laughs> yeah. I think it was. Nice. That's nice. sick. Do you guys, do, is there much contemporary music that you guys like? Oh, yeah. Not really. I think I have like one favorite Not band. Really. <laughs> I think I have like one band that I like and then I mercilessly shit on everything else. Yeah. Like current, like currently in existence, but I'm getting better about it sometimes, you know. I just, as long as I'm contributing to right now, as long as I'm, uh, you know, as long as I'm part of it and I'm contributing songs to uh, the zeitgeist or whatever and, you know, I'm playing the game right now, I feel like I feel the pressure comes off me. I don't feel as, like, resentful or I don't, I don't want to hate on shit as much. And then when I'm not working on stuff, I start to feel that, oh, I don't like a lot of this. Oh, I, I kind of want to shit on this dude. Like, more, I get that worse and worse when I'm not currently working on something. So I'm just, I'm, I'm best off always working on some sort of music, whether what genre or whatever, as long as I got something going that I can listen back to and be like, I'm going to put this out into the world. I'm doing my part. Then I'm good. If I don't yeah. do that, then I'm a very, I can be very negative and uh, yeah. un, 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 unhappy in general. I see well, yeah, it's the why isn't it me kind of thing. Yeah, I'm very sensitive yeah, but if about you're, that. Yeah, yeah. I'm very sensitive about that. Like, I have a tough, like, if, if, if somebody isn't, like, my friend, then I have a tough time crediting quality contemporary um, uh, work, you know. I mean, do you have, are there other podcasts you listen to where you're like, I want more of that vibe? Um, well, I, I think, uh, the, the one thing I'll say is that, um, I, uh, yeah, th there, there are some, there are some that I, that I've listened to and I think, well, I would like to try something like that. Like there's this, uh, podcast that, um, and I had the guy on my show, um, it's called Joker men mm -hmm. and they like do like, they like go through every album like they went through every single album of bob dylan every single album of bob dylan mm -hmm. like not just like you know blonde on blonde street you know like yeah like the you know 80s 90s and you know they'd have different guests on and stuff some of them would be their friends some of them would be a music critic and then they would like go deep into it it's like super well produced you know my show is like really lo-fi yeah and not topical you know but I did like I do like that like very that they have like this very focused, narrow, you know, granular. Yeah. Granularity is is underrated because I mean it just allows for, um, more exploration, more. Yeah, getting, you're getting talking about in, imposing rules essentially on yourself for the creation. Yeah, and I think yeah, it's like. I mean, me and Mario are kind of figuring that out, I think, as we go here. You know, it's like, what is what is the vibe? What are we trying to bring to it? And I think as we do more, hopefully, you know, uh, themes will start to sort of emerge that will um, identify it in a way. Because you do want to sort of elevate it a little bit over just like, here are three friends talking, right? You want to, mm -hmm. you got to allow some sort of, room in for the listener like i love the um scott ackerman adam scott music podcast and they like go through this discography for talking heads and rem and i've really been into it and then you get their sort of banter at the beginning but then they get into sort of the you know catalog and i mean i think jack does that too a lot for like perfume nationalist which i enjoy a lot just sort of cataloging art and stuff that he finds interesting um versus it just being or like low res on movies i like that one a lot as well where you know they're 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 using a film 
or a TV show as their framework. And, and yeah, you yeah. need, you need the framework, even, even for the sort of personal vlogging, whatever, like people do need to sort of understand what they're getting um, in order for it to be a successful uh, product, I think. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you need yeah. to give them a reason to listen, you know, like, yeah, why is this relevant? Why is this important to me? What am I getting out of it? I struggle with that sometimes where it's like, I just have literally had like, somebody on who's just like, a friend or somebody that I'm interested in, and just hope like hell that people want to hear me, you know, like, mm -hmm. are just curious or whatever. And maybe they don't have a reason to be curious. The only, yeah, the, the only rule is that I'm at the mall, you know? <laughs> Yeah. yeah it's easier when you have somebody like mario on or like you know like it would be like if i had you on dakota which i will um you know it's like okay well they have they're doing something and so we're going to kind of find out about yeah. that or you know we're going to find that they have a they haven't we i know what the narrative is other times it's like more unstructured but sometimes mm -hmm. that can be really fucking good mm -hmm. yeah early, early on in the show the show had a narrative because i had just like cold straight up quit my job yeah um and so there was like this like meta narrative it's like this guy quit his job to be a podcaster and so what are we going to learn about how that's going mm -hmm. now it's changed and i continue to wonder well what is the what am i really you know try, kind of trying to figure out what the show is about yeah i think that discovery yeah, just... is important you know because then again you don't want to end up in the Marin effect where he's so he's figured out his formula to a point where it might be less interesting, you know? Yeah. Well, he's, lucky. you know, he's going to talk to these certain points. That's true. He he's lucky because he can get a list celebrities that are, yeah, that, you want to hear, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, yeah, sometimes it's not evident. Like, why am I talking to this person or that person or whatever? But yeah. Um, so I don't know. Sometimes I do think about doing, I, you know, one of the things that I talk about a lot on the show is figures from broadcasting, you know, like Stern, Marin, you know, whatever it is. Um, and uh, and so that is something that I kind of wanted to explore a little bit more, maybe is like, you know, talking about rush or whoever mm -hmm. um but it's i'm still trying to figure it out because there are some people who are really really also attached to like it's super free form like never change i've heard yeah. people say that like don't switch don't change the formula now is that good for an artist to hear i don't know like is the podcast art or is it a just entertain is it just entertainment so do I do sure. keep it entertaining, you know, like, and I don't have any problem with that. I've always wanted to be an entertainer. Yeah. A lot just, to ju just, just to jump to Andy Kaufman real quick. Um, that was his big issue was that as soon as he got famous, he was rejecting everything that people liked about him. And he'd go on stage and he'd read a book, you know? So yeah, it's definitely a, balance you got to find you know i do like yeah, if, my, if i if my phone dies i'm not mad at you guys just so you know yeah no worries we can probably wrap up here soon too i think we've hit an hour um i just i look for a phone charger everywhere in my parents fucking house and i had no luck so yeah no worries kind of man understood well I'm fucked right now i just wanted to just say i do find that i really like our entertainers who are very comfortable with like this is the thing that i do this is what the people pay to see. And I'm mm -hmm. going to go fucking do it as good as, as great as possible, you know? Yeah. It's valuable. I mean, Sean Evans with Hot Ones is a great example. You know, I, I love that show. I know it's trash, but like, it's not, honestly. I mean, he has some good questions. And the structure is that he's going to make his guest eat 10 hot wings over the course of the interview. And like, that formula hasn't changed for all the years I've watched him, you know? So like you can change for sure. I, I think when people say don't change, it's almost like your parents trying to like prevent you from harm, you know? And it's like, 
at a certain point you do have to head out and strike a new territory and the people who are invested and have seen that what you can do work like they're not thinking about what else you can do most of the time i think i think i don't look at other people and go like if they're doing well i go thank goodness again get back to our first our our movie here you know you look great i feel terrible right you don't want to get there with your art you don't want to get there with your art where everyone says oh how fantastic and you go i feel so soulless in this moment you know yeah it's a good point all right well if uh if there's any other comments uh get them in but i i feel like we're at a good spot where we can wind down a little bit here no that was great it was really nice talking to you um everyone check out tales from the mall uh on patreon I'm a pay subscriber. For it. I'm a pay subscriber. For it, damn it. I'm I'm subscribing. We'll check out Mario and I on our socials. We need to start linking them to our YouTube videos, I feel like. I don't know if yeah, they're there I or always, not. No. I always forget uh, at least one to two things yeah. every single time. We're gonna I post make it. it we're gonna make it a little more uh yeah. We'll give me a yeah, up. give me a good uh give me a good copy pasta. So I don't Yeah, we'll uh, get some keep, good copy uh, pastas. I'm plastic repeater on Instagram. Um MC Mario Cuomo here for Instagram yeah. and Twitter, I believe. Is, yeah. Are you the same on Twitter? I'm yeah, Plaster Repeater I on think Twitter. I'm MC, MC Mario Cuomo on everything now, I think. Yeah. So. I'm Plaster Repeater on everything if y'all want to follow me. Um, Tales from the Mall on Instagram mm -hmm. and Twitter as well. Um, at Luso underscore Brendan. At Twitter. Luso. At yep. Luso. Wonderful. Um, uh, thank you so much, you guys. This is an it's a an honor, a pleasure. <laughs> I've enjoyed the hell out of it. We'll thank have you, you back dude. soon, Brendan. It thanks was really for, uh, great talking to you. Thanks for inspiring our own show, dude. Yeah, yeah of course, honestly, you, you guys are doing a great job. Thanks, dude. Look forward to talking to you soon. All right, thanks for recording this episode for us. Yeah, do, do, <laughs> oh, I, yeah. do I do I email this to? Uh, to Mario uh, or to, to, to my both? to probably to my email. I've yeah, been clipping. We've been everything. putting it on his uh, YouTube. Okay, I'll, yeah. I'll send it. I'll transfer it. I'll send you a we transfer link via email. Cool. So. Awesome. Thanks, man. All right. Thank, Thank you, guys. you, guys. You have a great right. good night. Good night, boys. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day you to too. all the fathers out there, and to all the fathers of America and the world. Good night. Yes. Night night.